That group of like 28 to 40, 42, it doesn't exist in our firehouse. And the question is why? What's going on? Is it something that we've done internally? Is it our management? Is it how we elected our chiefs? Is it the training? You know, is it that? Or is it simply society itself? Is it, you know, the fact that they are so busy and some of these people are working two, three jobs to support their families? You know, the economy's, you know, really tough. Uh, you know, or do, are they not aware of what's going on? Do they not understand, you know, the public service in general? Hey, guys. Welcome to the podcast. Um, we're here with Mike from Heroes Next Door. Mike, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Glad you could make it. I know it's a little bit of a drive for you. You had to come out of, uh, where, where are you? You're in Pennsylvania, correct? Yeah, yeah. I'm down near Philadelphia area, Chester County. Okay. So not too bad of a ride. It's about uh, two and a half hours to get up here. So Okay, yeah. Little, I can do these easy. It's little the little ones traffic? That, yeah. You know, on Heroes Next Door, we travel the country. So, you know, two-hour travel, I'm good with that. <laughs> You drive. You driving everywhere. Or you Most, got flying. Yeah, or yeah. A bit we of flew both? once. We flew out to Denver once um, and did uh, South Metro and stuff out there. But uh, most of the time, yeah, I drive. I uh, load up my crew and tow a trailer sometimes, and Ooh. you know, go wherever we need to go. And my last trip was thirty five hundred miles with a trailer behind me. So I got Super Cruise now. <laughs> I cheated. I went yeah. and got the Super Cruise in my truck because I do. I do a lot of driving myself, so okay. I'm used to it. I go to Ohio and I go to. The Carolinas a lot, so right, right. I was like, you know what, I'm gonna treat myself and get the Super Cruise. So yeah. it drives itself. My wife doesn't like to drive in it, though. When okay. It's driving itself. It's right. It's a little. It's a little. It takes a little getting used to, but it is. It is a uh, nice just to kind of sit back and just kind of stare a little bit. Right. right. But it, it does know if you're watching or not because it, it it has <laughs> a camera. It, yeah, it's got a camera facing. I got the typical F-150, but it's lifted, so you know gas mileage isn't the best to start with, and then you throw a trailer on it. You know, you're getting eight miles to the gallon. Yeah, you're going gas station. To, you got your gas station hopping at that point. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I hear you. So, Mike, tell us a little bit about uh, about yourself, your history, and, and how you started this whole uh, Heroes Next Door. Sure, sure. Um, I'm a paramedic firefighter by trade, uh, okay. and I always start with paramedic because that's my, my, my true love. That's what I do all the time. Uh, firefighter, I came into a little bit later in my career, um, and I've been doing it since 1994, uh, absolutely love it. God's given me, been giving me a real good career. I've had the opportunity to do um, critical care transport. I did pediatric transport, uh, 911 service, both chase car and MICU. I flew with Sky Flight Care out of Brandywine Hospital as a flight medic for a number of years. I worked with the county SWAT team. Uh, I've done the task force, so I was on task force one, where we went down to Katrina and Rita, Sandy, all those kind of things. Um, so I've done some national stuff and I've done some international medicine where we went to Mount Everest and did some medical missions after the earthquakes up there. And, um, you know, I've had a good career. So, and that's kind of why things got started on Heroes Next Door. And what's going on is my daughter and my family grew up in, in public safety. Okay. You know, they're used to me, you know, doing Christmas on, you know, I'm, out on a fire call because yep. someone, you know, lit their house off or, you know, I'm always working in public safety is pretty much a full-time job. Or 24-7, you're going to get called at some point, especially as a volunteer. You never know when that call is going to come out. Um, they were fine with it. They didn't know any different. You know, they were my victims a lot of times <laughs> going through classes and, you know, all those kind of things. But when my oldest got married, she married someone that had no idea what the public service was about. And that's kind of where the the idea started coming about, about Heroes Next Door. Um, started out, he married into the family. You know, during Christmas time, we talk about the stories and the calls. And he's like, man, this is really cool. I had no idea this kind of stuff happens that, you know, people next door go to do these kind of things. And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> How do you not know this? I said, every firehouse that you travel to says volunteers wanted. And he's like, yeah, but I never thought I was qualified. I'm like, Okay, there's a disconnect here. So something's happening. Yeah. What's going on? When I started, we had 20, 30 guys at the firehouse that would show up consistently. You had to fight to get on the truck just to get just to get a seat on the truck. Yep. And usually, you know, we had the old Mac. You'd ride the back rail, and you'd get there. 
Well, engine, as, engine cal cover, wherever, wherever, yeah, wherever you fit, guys. Yeah, exactly. I remember those days. Yeah, yeah. And the the issue has become over the years, and I thought, you know, it was just Pennsylvania, but it's all over the nation. Oh, no, it's nation. Volunteerism and even recruitment and retention for the next generation is really, really down. And that's not just for EMS and fire. That's for police, too. You know, public service in general has been down for recruitment and retention uh, in regards to getting that next generation to fill. So we started talking and said, hey, what can we do about this? He was a YouTuber. And, of course, right. I teased him for a year. I'm like, that's not a real job. Like, how does that even make money? You know, that doesn't make any sense. So in 2020, we got together. We decided to create Heroes Next Door uh, as an LLC. We launched in March of 2020. Okay. And the idea is to raise awareness on the public platforms or the social media platforms that the new generation is using. The TikTok, the Instagram, the YouTubes, you know, everything that we can possibly do to get the word out there to say, hey, here's what's going on in the world around you. Kind of break out of your little bubble a little bit and see what's going on and how you can give back to your community. Uh, so between his mind of YouTube and all the social media stuff and my background within the service, we, that was a great combination to, gotcha. to launch. So. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a great story because we're, we're suffering, you know, the same in Jersey. I've been a volunteer for 30, I just finished my 33rd year. I'm in my 34th year as a volunteer firefighter. So just like you're saying, when I, when I first joined, we were at the firehouse all the time. Yeah. It was always like eight or ten young guys. We hung out there. You know, we, we hung out daily there. You yeah. know, whenever we were done working or guys would have, just meet up there and hang out and go do stuff, come back there. And now it's like kind of like the guys show up at the firehouse. They As soon as the call's over, guys disappear. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, it's, you know. They listen, got rid of all the shuffleboards and all those kind of we things. We still got our <laughs> shuffleboard. We refuse to get rid of it. It's the longest Good, table ever. <laughs> um, we still have our shuffleboard. But, you know, it's, it's, it's weird because, like you're saying, it's – I don't know if it's just – they're not interested. There's not a draw to it. They're they're unaware of it. I don't know, but it's 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 obviously it's it's hurting us more in the northeast because we we rely heavily on volunteers up here. Yeah. You know, I, I talk to guys all over the country, and I know you do too. And, and yeah. some of these departments have been combinations or 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 paid or partial paid or paid on calls for for years because they're in these rural areas that don't have the population to. To sustain it. Right. We have heavy populations here, and we still can't sustain the volunteerism. Yeah. I've actually been finding it, even in the heavy populations, that society thinks it's already a paid service. So they don't even think to volunteer. And in the more populated, the rural, I find more volunteers than I do in the the heavy population because they just assume I call 911, you come. There's a firefighter. I see, you know, Chicago Fire. I see all these fire shows on TV. That's the way it is. Uh, And it's not. You know, those are the rarities. Those are the bigger departments, you know, the the New York Fire and the Philly Fires and stuff like that. That's not us. That there's so much more of America that needs to be covered, and there's no way that we can do that by having a 100 percent paid services across the it'll, board. It'll never. It'll never happen. No, it, it's, it's, it's financially not feasible. No, it's it's not even it. it it's unstable in some areas, right? Your, yeah. Your taxes will go go through the roof. It's crazy um, what it would cost to to fund all that, and and to think about how much savings these these municipalities have. Or these fire districts, or whatever they are, right? By using volunteers, and you would think they would be doing more outreach, right? As you know, mayors and councils and and commissioners would be like, "Hey, listen, how do we attract more people? Maybe maybe update our firehouses, make them a little bit more, you know." But it's it's always about the the, the bottom line dollar, right? Until all of a sudden, they somebody comes in and says, "Hey, listen, we're out of volunteers. This is what's going to cost you to run a paid department," and they're going to go, "Right? Oh, we, we what what happened? Yeah. What happened is, you know." You know the vo- the age of the volunteers in, in my department. You know, we, we go out on a call. We're averaging in our in our forties and fifties. Yeah. When I when I joined, the you know the average age was about thirty five. I was one of the younger guys, a couple older guys, and 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 the median was about thirty five. Yeah. That group of like twenty eight to forty forty two, it doesn't exist in our firehouse. Few and far between. Yeah. And the question is, why? What's going on? Is it something that we've done internally? Is it our management? Is it how we elected our chiefs? Is it the training? You know, is it that? Or is it simply society itself? Is it, you know, the fact that, you know, they are so busy and some of these people are working two, three jobs to support their families? You know, the economy's you know, really tough. 
uh, you know, or do, are they not aware of what's going on? Do they not understand, you know, the public service in general? Yeah, and it's, it's funny you mention that because we went on a, you know, I'm in a volunteer firehouse, and, and we went on a call. It's been a couple of years now, but it was post-COVID. And uh, we, we go on a call, and we're close to New York City, so it was people that had moved from New York City. And I walk up to the door, and she goes, oh, my alarm's been going off for a while. It took you guys a while to get here. I said, well, we were home. And she goes, are you working from home because of COVID? I go, no, we're a volunteer fire department. She goes, oh, I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. So they came out of New York City. They assumed, you know, you know, the fire alarm goes off, the firemen show up. They don't, they don't question how we got there or, yep. or, or, or what happened, you know, you know. So I had to explain to her, and she's like, you guys aren't paid? And I said, no, we're not paid. And she goes, oh, I had, she, and she really had no idea. She was kind of dumbfounded by it, like that it, it, it was even a, you know, a thing to have volunteers. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's going more across the country now than it has in days past. Before, you know, like we said, you know, you have 20, 30 guys, your family's involved in volunteering. You know, it was almost a community event back in the day. And now they just assuming you know, I had the same kind of scenario. We show up and they're like, why did it take you eight minutes to get here? I'm like, eight minutes? We rocked it. Like, they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, we had to go from our house, get our, you know, blue light it to the station, pick up the truck, come to your place and then get here. So eight minutes, we rocked it. Yeah. Like, And they're like, oh, I, I had no idea. Same they, think they think you're sitting in, in, in the yeah. firehouse waiting for the, for the tones to drop. Right, right. right. But on the other side, they'll turn around and go, why the fire guys are sitting at the firehouse? I'm paying them to do something. They should be doing something. And you're like... Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a it's a no win situation. I mean, it, it, it's becoming tougher and tougher though. Um, you know, for us, I know, you know, there's days that we roll out three guys, and you know, you know, I could be the youngest guy on the on the apparatus, and I'm not a spring chicken myself. Right. You know, so, right. Right. But uh, it's it's, I I don't know what the answer is. I know our train. You know, you, we get a lot of people come through the door, and you get a guy in his 30s coming through the door, and he's and and he's just got a young kid or something at home just starting a family, and then you tell them that they got to go to this academy for almost seven months, two nights a week, a couple Saturdays a month, and they're like, well, right, I don't right. have that kind of time. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, that, and that's that's an issue, too. I mean, there's got to be a better way to attack it, to, to break it down. I mean, even some kind of e-learning for some of it. Yeah. I mean, does it all have to be yeah. in front of an instructor in a classroom? And most firehouses have drill nights. Like, can't we, you know – continue to go back to the old days where that was your training. You showed up for drill night and, you know, they took you through hoses. They took you through ladders, you know, those kind of things. Instead of having that, I don't want to say that education of fire one, fire two is bad. By no way. It's important information. But is there a way to kind of break that down into smaller sections that people can absorb a little bit better? Because it is a volunteer. If you're going to a paid service and you need to go to academies, Great. Fire one, fire two, right You're up the You're paid to be there. You're paid to be there. That, that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, so the question becomes, how do you balance that? You know, because you're trying to make the people safe. You know, with all the lawsuits that are out there, that, oh, you, you gave me cancer because you, I didn't know about these carcinogens, or you did this, you did that. I think we got so afraid of saying, hey, we're still going to educate our own people uh, to a certain extent. I mean, some online learning, too, would make it. You know, because if you can, if you could work at your own pace. Hey, listen, I got three hours Sunday morning. I can go do modules one, two, and three, and, and bang those out. And then, you know, maybe check in. You know, have have a, a check in with a with an instructor once a week, once every two weeks. You know, I mean, the doctors are doing it. Yeah. We, you know, medical professionals are doing it, but we can't do it in the fire service. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think part of it comes down to I think the instructors are a little bit. You know, they don't want to lose their. Their, their jobs, they don't want to cut back on instructors, so they're fighting it a little bit. Right. And, you know, I understand the, the whole concept, but I, I agree with you. There's got to be a better way, even, even if it's smaller modules. Hey, start with, you know, making the guy an exterior firefighter. Yeah. Get through these classes. You're exterior only. Then finish these classes. Then you're interior. Like, get your qualifications. And I think the other thing, too, is when you tell a guy, hey, listen, here you are. Welcome aboard. You're a probie. You know, you're going to help us clean the firehouse. You can ride on the trucks, but you really can't do anything else. Guys are like... Do I really want to do that? Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and that's another thing that turns people off, you know. But, uh, you know, I remember when I when I joined, it was, you know, you didn't ask what you had to do. You just saw what everybody else was doing, and you're like, okay, so I guess i got to clean the clean the kitchen because that's what all the new guys seem to be doing. Right, right. You know, and, and now, you know, we, we got guys that come in, and they're like, they sit in the, in, the, in the reclining chair, and right away they grab their phone, and I'm like, you've been here three months. Like, you got to help out in the kitchen first. Right. Right. And listen, we all we all take our t our turn helping out. 
even the older guys. But you know, as a younger guy, you got to step it up and you know show you want to be there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think society has kind of changed that too. You know, I see other podcasts and and YouTube channels out there that are promoting do the bare minimum. You know, I'm I'm a volunteer or I work for you. I'm going to do the bare minimum. I work nine to five. I'm just a number to you. And I don't know when that changed over society. That you know, when you go to work for a company. They invite you in. They they want you to do well. They want you to improve. They want they don't want you to just do the bare minimum for the, the little amount of money that you get. They you know you have to kind of contribute to the the overall goal or mission of that fire company. And if you're doing the bare minimums, it's no wonder no one wants to do anything more. Well, and if everybody does the bare minimum, then the job doesn't get done, right? Right. Because I mean, I know I was chief a long time ago, and I know our chief now is is a sec. You know, he's coming through for a second time and. The amount of hours you have to put in to be a, you know, a chief of the department now is absolutely insane. Like, you know, the amount of time he spends with the politicians and, you know, dealing with the, the town and, and, and meetings with them and meetings with the police department, EMS, and, and all the other stuff that they, you know, when they have an event going on. And he doesn't get anything, you know, there's no stipend. Right. He gets a car. Yeah. You know, listen, I'll leave the car at the firehouse and, you know, you know I don't... <laughs> I don't have the time for it because I'm running a business, but, you know, and God bless the, the fact that he can do it. But there's a, you know, there's a lot of departments that guys have been chief for 15, 16 years and they love doing it. And it, I'm glad that they can do it because I enjoyed it when I was chief. Yeah. I just don't have the time to go back and, and do anything like that. I, I really don't, can't commit that kind of time. I got, you know, my, my kids are getting older now, so it, it's become easier for me to free up my time. They drive on their own because they're both driving. One's in, One's a senior in high school. One's in co- a senior in college. So right. I'm at a different spot now, but it's still, you know, the demands of, of work and, and, and stuff like that are, and trying to, like, go to meetings during the day. I, I don't have that kind of free time. Right. Let me ask you this question, though. Do you think some of it is also the culture of what we built over the years, that good old boys club, where we tend to not include the new generation? Do you think any of that has to play a, a small part in why – we're at where we're at today. It, it may, it may, and you know, we we've we've tried like outreach through different programs that we do at our fire at our firehouse, and we try and get the younger guys to go out and do the outreach because nobody wants to hear from me, like they want to hear from a younger guy, right? Like, hey, listen, come on, join the fire department. This is this is what we're doing. This is, you know, if I go there and talk, or you you go there and talk, it's like, okay, some some old dude came and talked to me about being a fireman. It's it sounds good, but what does he know? You know, and so. We've tried to engage our younger guys to kind of, hey, listen, bring two friends to the firehouse. Um, but even, like, we used to have events, and like you were talking about, we used to have events at our firehouse. We used to have a, a clam bake for all our members in the summer. And it was hu- a huge family event. Now we, we, we stopped doing it because it just dwindled down to nothing. And, and at the end, we were getting guys to show up. The younger guys would show up. They'd eat the food. They'd help clean up, and then they'd, they'd be gone. Where we, we would hang out the whole day, set up, clean up. It was kind of like part of the culture was right. like, hey, listen, we started making the, the, the chowder the night before. You hung out all night. You had a, you know, you had everybody had a job to do and we did it overnight. We all slept a couple hours. We got up the next morning and it was it was all it was just a part of the the culture. And you, you wanted to do it. You were like excited about, you know, hey, listen, we can't wait for the clam bait to come up. We, we lost that event. And and you could be right. It could just be that, you know, there's a disconnect between. The older generation and the newer generation, and we're not we're not connecting with them. I don't know. Right, right. Well, and that's one of the things that I'm trying to address on our channel. Now, I, I don't know if you've seen much of the channel. You know, seen it a little bit. You, a- YouTube is a unique beast in itself. <laughs> you know, you have to have what we call different buckets. You know, our major bucket that we view are the station cribs and station rigs. Everybody loves those. But we're also trying to portray, you know, the other struggles that are going on, the other, you know, stories behind the stories. Uh, we more started to do a day in the life kind of series, those kind of things. And the one thing that I'm trying to do is say, hey, this is what we are doing and this is where we're trying to go, and we need you involved in that. And how can we get you involved? How can we get the social medias, the YouTube, the TikToks, and stuff like that? And believe it or not, I still have run across some chiefs, uh, and I'm using chiefs in a broad term, that are afraid of social media. They're like, oh, you can't, you know, here's an 18 page policy that says what you can post, what you can't post, and how that. I, I got where they came from, but we need to figure this out. Because that's where the younger generation is living. 
you know, they're yeah, you oh, sit absolutely. down in a restaurant, they're all at their on their phones. And to be honest with you, I've lately been on my phone because that's my new job, you know, trying yep. to understand what this generation's coming behind me are and how they operate, how do they think. And hopefully by creating a channel like Heroes Next Door that we can open awareness to that those next generations. Fortunately, we've had some success. You know, we've had some people call me up or email me and say, hey, because of you, I'm now volunteering. I had no idea I could even do that. You know, they always thought they needed the education before they got there. So a lot of my videos, I ask the same questions over and over because I don't know what video they've seen, right? Yeah. You know, they could they, only they see could... the first one ever. Or, so a piece, or a piece of one, right? A piece of one. So I'll ask the same thing. Hi, how do they get a hold of you? You know, do they need the education? I already know the answer to those questions, but I have to ask those because that person, that one person watching that that video may not know that. Uh, and that's one thing that I continue to try to do and promote what we're doing here. Yeah, so you try to make that connection for them. Hey, listen, just reach out to your local your local fire department, right? And they'll, right. they'll, they'll point you in the right direction. Right, because honestly... The other things that we we forget about are the all the other behind the scenes volunteers that we need, the administrative staff, you know, the people that can help write grants, uh, the people that can do electrician and drywall. And when you need work on the firehouse, those are the guys that we also need. If you don't want to fight a fire, I get that. You know, some people don't want to go into a fire. That's fine, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be part of the community of a firehouse. Oh yeah, and and there's like you said, there's a million jobs to be done. Yeah, even if it's running the fundraiser. Running a running a, a, a social event of some sort, right? Do something, yeah, or education. You know, even if you don't go into the building, bring in an education. How to do CPR, yep. how to do you know awareness or whatever. Um, I, I think if we continue to move forward and doing things like this, the podcast that people are listening to, doing the videos on you know whatever platform there is, and there's always a new one coming yep. up. There'll be another. One, there'll be another one next week, and another one after but that. But whatever those social platforms are. We as senior leadership need to understand this is what we need to do. These are the things that we're going to have to bring to the table, you know. And I've come across some stations that have been successful with that. You know, they brought in the things that are attracting the younger generation, making sure you have good Wi-Fi, making sure you have the ability to bring in and plug in your computers, you know, all the electric stuff and, you know, allowing them to do those kind of things. Give a little workstation. So if they're going to college or going to school, they, right. they can, instead of going to the library, they can go there and hang out. Right. And then right. If, the, if the pager goes off, they can go on a call and come back and finish their work. And there's actually an, another station most recently in East Brandywine that created an entire work area for those that work from home nowadays. You know, after, you know, great. after COVID, people are like, oh, I can work from home. And they bring in their computer like, OK, well, I have a space for you. Basically, I give you an office space. You come here, yeah. do your work. But if there's a call comes out, stop your work for a minute and go, and go help and then go back to your work. It was awesome. It's, it's a great idea to bring those people they that even, are. I never even thought of that. Working That's from great. home are now working from the office, but they're doing it. You know, they're doing a dual role. It's yeah, awesome. Yeah, they're working remotely from, from the firehouse. Yeah, yeah. And you're setting them up with, like, a nice little office they can work in so they don't have to work from their kitchen. Right, right. And so it's, it's a win-win, right? Right. And for the business, for the company they work for, it's a win-win, too. Right. Because now they have a spot to work in. They're not using space at the office. Okay, so you lose them for a little bit here and there, but they, it also proves that – they've proven that people that work from home work longer hours, yeah. right? So. They're getting the most out of many house. So exactly, yeah. So you know, as people are redesigning their firehouses or building new firehouses, those are the kind of things that you really need to think about of what we need to incorporate in those firehouses. It's a good, it's a good point. It really is because I I would have never mm -hmm. thought of a like like a work area like you know I've thought of like pods for studying, but I never said oh somebody working from home could could possibly do that too. It just never occurred to me. Right. So. That's neat that they, you know, you get, and you, like you said, you get to go out there and see stuff and you're like, wow, I never even thought of that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And fortunately, you know, our goal for Heroes Next Door is to hit all 50 states. We wanted to hit as many firehouse, police, and EMS stations as we can. Um, <clears throat> I think we are at 13 states so far. So we got a lot more to go. And, you know, we're going to continue that. Um, takes time, though. It does take time and it takes money. You know, oh, it, it takes time. It takes money, it, it and it all, it's it's your it's mostly your time, and you're it, it, yeah. you're trying to volunteer. Yep. You know, you see you have, and you have a work life balance that you have to maintain, right? Yeah. So. yeah. And, and the dollar, I mean, gas isn't cheap. So yeah. me traveling, I pay for my film guys, these guys buying the cameras. I pay for my audio. I pay for you know the editors and all that kind of stuff because 
I didn't learn all that stuff. I had no idea how to edit or film or any of that kind of stuff. You know, I went to school. I got my master's in organizational leadership. My goal was to become that chief. But that's a small niche in some little rural, you know, community. By using the social media platforms, we can increase that and say, hey, we can educate much more people by using social media platforms. So, like I said, I, my goal is to hit all 50 states, as many as we can, and to raise awareness for those different areas. And I'm surprised at how many times we go to these smaller stations. It's two bays. You know, I went to the one in uh, Ada, Ohio. It was like three bays, you know, and they're like, oh, look, come do a station cribs with me. Loved it. Guys were awesome. But I get there, and it basically was a, a, an open uh, community room, a kitchen, and a storage area. I'm like, how do I create a whole episode out of this? But we made it work because these guys are important for that community, you know, and, and to talk about those different kind of things and show, hey, I don't need the 30,000 square foot fire department, you know, like uh, the one I did out of Adams County, Colorado. Great department, great way to do that, but they're a paid department. I also want to hit those one stall garages, you know, like I did in Lebanon, uh, PA. That those are another fire and they, have, and they have a lot of a lot of those have a lot of history to them too. Oh, yeah, when you talk yeah. to those guys, you know, yeah, especially the older ones. Even if they're single single uh, bay garages, a lot of times, oh, this is where we had the hay for the. Horses. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, that's exactly what it yeah, was. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. So yeah, yeah, we had to reinforce the entire floor because the horses, you know, trampled through it, and now we got a truck. <laughs> yep, it's 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 pretty interesting. It's funny you say Ada because my son lives out is going to college out that way. Okay. So I know I know exactly the area you're talking about and it's a lot of a lot of prefab metal building type firehouses they're, they you know but they're they make them work and they they use them. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah. You know they don't have to be fancy, it just has to be functional. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but they were they were actually, you know, talking about, "Hey, how do we get the younger generation back?" And the, the first thing they said their chief, "We want to get heroes next door here so at least we get some public awareness." And then we want to start maybe changing our our uh, supply room into a crew room. This station didn't even have a crew room. And, like, we grew up in crew rooms. Like, that's where we played our shuffleboard and watched TV and did, you know, the uh, Super Bowls and stuff like yep. that and brought the family down for Christmas dinners. And, you know, and then that's how it was. But these stations, they don't have any of that. They're like, it's a garage. Come here for a fire call and go home. I'm like, you're missing a little bit here. <laughs> Just a little bit. Yeah, the firehouse table is an important is an important piece of the firehouse, right? Right, right. The exactly. kitchen table or the or the eating table, whatever, yeah. whatever it is. But that's where most problems get solved, by the way. Getting around the kitchen table, whether it's at your house or the firehouse, uh, that's that's where most problems get solved. Yeah, unless I, I watch a comedian and she talks about every time her husband comes back from the firehouse table after a twenty, he's a paid guy. Yeah, and she talks about I think my husband comes back dumber from the firehouse every time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she talks about the, the, the round tables they have at the kitchen and the discussions they have because he brings them home. And right. she's like, I, I can't believe they talk about this stuff. So, <laughs> But it's, it's interesting. And, and it, it's funny you mention that because we have a beautiful table at our firehouse now. And guys are sitting there on their phones. Yeah. It's different. We, we used to have conversations. Now it's, you know, guys are into their phones more than they are into the conversations. So. Right, right. But like you said, it's a different generation. Right? Different generation. But also I think it, it, it we've kind of – let it lax. Uh, I was actually just watching Chicago Fire, believe it or not. I understand what it is. It's entertainment. But the one new chief that came in was like, hey, put your phones in this bin when you get to the firehouse, and we're going to talk to each other. We're going to get rid of the phones. Maybe that's something that we need to think about. I thought, you know what? That's actually probably not a bad idea. When you get to the firehouse, you should put your phone in the bin. It's there if it needs it. People know where you're at. If an emergency comes out, most likely you're going to get called to it anyways. Um but put it in the bin and, and hang out with each other and, you know, talk face to face like we're doing here today. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's lost on, on a lot of younger people. And I, and I think that may be an issue, too, is do, they just don't want to go to a firehouse and have to interact with people because a lot of people just aren't comfortable doing that because they've grown up on the phone. Right. 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 So it's a different it's a little bit of a different mindset. And maybe, you know. We run drills every Monday night. Maybe instead of running four drills a month on a Monday night, we have an open house and invite the public in. Yeah. And maybe maybe one of those nights you pull one person in. Yep. That's one more person you got in your in your ranks that hopefully, you know, will be a chief someday or something like that. I mean, there's I mean the 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 options are limitless, but it's just a matter of, you know, how much time you can put in and how much effort you can put in. Like like you're saying, you want to hit all 50 states, and I'm I'm sure you are. 
Yeah. You're, I'm sure your outreach is reaching all 50 states already. Yeah, and beyond. I mean, I've gotten invites to the UK, Australia, Germany, Costa Rica. How are you driving to those? Yeah. <laughs> we'll work on it. But, you, you'll, yeah. you can put it the... Uh, the, the lifted F-150 on a, on a boat and, and take it over there. Drive it on over, yeah, yeah. But as we continue to grow, you know, I hope to get to those different countries and, you know, see the difference. You know, one of the biggest things is, you know, over here in America, and we're talking about, you know, trucks and stuff like that, we have massive fire trucks. We have massive amounts of equipment compared to the U.K. They're like, we can do the same thing with a much smaller truck. Why is that? What's the difference? Do we need to go big? Can we go smaller? Now, I understand that our mission profile is different. Our geography is different on what we have to accomplish. Yep. Uh, and that, that plays, a trick in, uh, plays a factor in it. But, you know, let's try to get out of our own little sandboxes and see what everybody else is doing to make it more efficient across the board. Yeah, I mean, you talk, you talk about the you know, European, and you mentioned a European fire helmet to the guys around here, and they're like, no way. No way would I wear that helmet. It looks like yeah. a fighter a fighter pilot, pilot yeah. helmet. And it's like, well, maybe there's a there's a reason they're wearing it, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like why? Like just I, I understand traditional fire helmets. I, I get it. We love our tradition. Firehouse is built on tradition, especially here in America. We're very proud of that tradition. And, you know, but there has to come a point to like, well, what was the benefit of them going to that helmet? Or what's the benefit of our helmet? Maybe they need to switch to our helmet kind of thing. Yep. You know, we don't always have to switch to theirs, but if we don't share that information, you know, they may have come across something and say, hey, this really works well because it maybe sheds the water off your coat a little bit better. You don't have to dry it off as much or the shield is a little bit better than than what it is. Or we say, no, ours are much better because of X, Y, Z. Yep. But if we don't share that information, no one's going to know. No one's going to get better. You know, maybe there's a hybrid out there that no one's thought about yet. And that's the next generation yep, to take the, take two of those and say, hey, I've just built a, a brand new helmet that's the traditional American looking helmet with the benefits of a European helmet. I don't know. Could be down the road. Never know. Right. 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 It's, it's funny you mentioned apparatus and things like that, because I watched a video. Uh, they did a side by side American firefighters fighting the car. I don't know if you've seen this one. They do the American fight, fight in a car fire, and then they do a European. I think and, I have, yeah. And they yeah. literally pull up, and they just they, they direct the, the bumper nozzle yeah. right at the car. And, you know, they show the guys they're still trying to pull hose and get their masks on. And meanwhile, these guys, by the time they get out of the truck, the fire's out yeah, because they're grabbing tools, and then they're going to do overhaul because they have the little bumper nozzle. And I'm like, right, right. Yeah, maybe that does work. I think that I mean, one was paired with one where um, – it was a, a dual, a reaction kind of video, and it was a, um, a sewage truck that pulled up to a fire, car fire, and he just opened up and poured the sewage on the car fire, put it out before the fire truck got there. I saw that one, And it too. was paired with that same video that you were talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, so there is other technology out there that maybe, you know, hey, maybe the bumper line is, you know, maybe the bumper nozzle is a good thing. Right. You know, I know they use it a lot in wildland firefighting. Yeah, know? yeah. With these EVs and stuff, you don't want to get close to them. Maybe you just... Throw Touch water in that way. I right. Mean. Hit it from two different angles or three different angles. And yeah, nowadays, right. even the piercing nozzles that you can just tap through the hood from a distance, you're yep. good to go. But we'll get, you know, people don't like that because they like the hands-on, pulling the hose, stretching lines. I And I understand. Yeah. I'm that way, too. But yeah. when you're limited manpower during the day, it's great to be able to have that option because then, you know, it's two less guys you need on a on a hose line. They can start doing something else. Right. Or right. Pull, pull that secondary line and at least, you know, start fighting it. But... Yeah. Well, the one thing saying that's out there is the first thing that we need to do is change. Second thing is to do it or they hate change, but they hate the way it is. <laughs> you know, so there's got to be some kind of a, a break in there and figure out, you know, how can we do this better? How can we continue to improve and bring back that generation of volunteerism, bring back that generation of recruitment and retention? You know, and I do a lot for fire departments, but even the police department trying to get a police officer uh, the academies is next to impossible because of the way they've been portrayed over the years, people are like, oh, you know, all police officers are, are bad people. And it, it's just not true. And if we don't have those kind of people that help with these public service, you know, society is going to really, really struggle. Right. I'm, a, I'm a paramedic, paramedic by trade. We struggle right now to fill the trucks. There's times where we're going to have to put a truck down, so you have to wait an extra 10, 15, 20 minutes before you even get a truck available because we don't have the personnel to cover all the 911 calls. Well, the other problem you have, especially in the medical side, is you're getting burnout. 
Oh yeah. You're getting burnout and you're getting suicide too, which is a which is a huge issue. More so on the medical side than on, on, on the fire. Yeah. It affects mostly medical, then police, then fire. Unless they've been involved, you know, unless fire has been involved in a traumatic event, usually. Yeah. But I, I know medical. You guys are seeing a, a huge increase in the suicide rates. Yeah, Just the mental health is, is definitely a challenge. Uh, but I, uh, my strong belief is that also comes back down to the, some of the leadership that we have out there, um, and the lack of education of how to understand what's going on, and to make us aware as leadership that these problems are here. You know, before, like, oh, suck it up. That's just part of the job. Go home, you know, have a beer and come back tomorrow. You'll be fine. Well, that's no longer the case. We really need to figure out, hey, you know, seeing this dead child, you know, this mass casualty incident or something like that, that really affects people in different ways. And just because me as a 30-year veteran have seen it and I'm able to deal with it doesn't mean this guy does. And, you know, we have to pay attention to our brothers and sisters. We have to make sure that they're not going home and, you know, going into alcohol or drugs or anything else. You know, give them another outlet. And my personal opinion, the best outlet is the firehouse itself. Yeah. You know, you get out and, you know, exercise and, and do those different things will help with that mental health. But it, I think it really becomes down to leadership and paying attention to the people around. But we're so busy because we're so strapped that we, we kind of lose track of it a little bit, in my opinion. And you're not watching people. So you, they leave and you don't know what's going on right. with them. So right. when guys are hanging out at the firehouse, you're like, oh, something's wrong with him. Yeah, he's sitting in the corner. Yeah. He's not talking. Yeah. Or all of a sudden, he's on his phone. Like, why is he on his phone all the time? Yeah. He's so, not hanging out with us. Yeah, you can kind of pick up on it a little differently. When you don't see guys, it's – Right. You don't you don't know what they're suffering through. and Right. And especially with, you know, the trauma, you know, over the years of, of constantly seeing, seeing the bad, right? It, that's – yeah. What weighs on a lot of people. Yeah. One thing that I've kind of tried to do in my practice is after every call, whether it's a bad call or a good call, I do a debriefing, a hot wash, I, I call it. You know, what did we do well? What did we do bad? And what can we do better in the future? And I try to get a good sense of my crew that helped me out there uh, of, of what happened during this call. And, you know, I'm 30 years into it, and I'm still learning stuff. Oh, I could have done better this. You know, or I could have communicated this better. I could have said my pleas and thank yous a little bit better. You know, or, hey, we probably should have intubated that this time rather than this time. Yeah, oh, you're right. Those critical um, critiques are important. And I don't take offense to it if someone says, hey, did you ever think of this? But I think society, too, in general, as soon as you start, to start critiquing them, they get offended. And I'm like, I'm not offending you. I'm just trying to, to, to make sure, first of all, are you okay? And what can we do better together to make this more successful? And I think that's in any of the services, whatever, you know, whatever event it might be, police event, fire event, you know, we have a house fire. You know, we critique it afterwards. And listen, guys don't want to hear the negative of it, but they have to hear it because that's the only way you're going to change things. Right. Right? Hey, maybe, you know, hey, maybe you, as the officer – first officer on the engine, you could have done this. I didn't even think about it. Right. But instead, guys are, you know, right away, I, I don't want to, you know. Right. You know, so I, I, there is a whole culture about critiquing, so. Yeah. And, and I think critiques, if anybody's listening to this, critiques in the public safety are important. You have to have those critical critiques. And take that and learn from that. Uh, and that's where you're going to make yourself better as you continue on. And that's going to help your mental health. Oh, absolutely, because – then you then you understand other, what other people's perspective is and and what other people might be going through as well. Right. You know, it, it does help to, you know, go back through these calls and just kind of go over things. Right. We do our debriefs now, though. When we have like a, a fire alarm or something not so serious. We go to the local Dunkin' Donuts as a crew and that's how we debrief, which which helps because then the guys get to sit there for 15, 20 minutes, have a coffee. Yeah. BS a little bit, kind of have a little bit of, of downtime. Let that adrenaline kind of wear off. And, and, then we, and we get back to the station. Right. Because when you got that adrenaline, everything's good. You're like, this was great. This was the most awesome call ever. Then you get home and you're like, I probably shouldn't have cut that roof that early. I probably should have waited till you know, they ventilated here before I actually put water on it because I kind of steamed that guy. You know, and only when you get home, you're like, crap. I, I, I could probably get it done better. Yeah, when you, sit, when you sit down and you decompress it all in your house, you're like, wait, wait a minute. Did that really happen that way or was it that way? Yeah, it's yeah. Well, you're right. When the adrenaline's flowing, it's it's a whole different uh, different ball game. Right. So, 
So what's uh, what's the goals? What are the goals? I know the outreach, getting to the, all 50 states. Like. Yeah, yeah. The goal for us is to continue to, you know, hit those social media platforms. Uh, I most recently hired a company to help me with my Facebook because each platform has its own unique problems and its Absolutely. own unique algorithms and stuff like that. I'm working on the YouTube side of it. I got another company working on the Facebook side of it, the TikTok, the Instagram, those kind of things. It's always hard to get you. You got to go vertical, you do horizontal filming and all those different kind of nuances. I'm trying to improve my product every time I go. If anybody's out there and they've watched Mr. Beast, any of his stuff on YouTube, he's the, the king of YouTube, in my opinion. He said early on in his career, every time you do something, you're going to improve. You got to improve. You think you did it great. Then you look back two years from now, you're like, man, that one really sucked. But at the time, you thought it was awesome. Always trying to improve. That's what we're doing at Heroes Next Door. We're always trying to try new things. But with that comes with people that don't watch as much. They're like, oh, I, I really wanted to watch a station cribs. I really wanted to do a station rigs. But now you're talking about, you know, the drone program and the band that's coming on. Well, I've done a four-part series on drones because that's going to be a huge factor coming across in America if we don't yeah. do something about it. And I thought it was very important to take the time and take the, those weekends to talk about the different programs that are out there and potentially what's going to happen. So that's the one thing. I have right now almost 300 different stations throughout the country that have asked me to come. I don't do uh, cold calls anymore. So if anybody's out there listening and you want Heroes Next Door to come, please send us an invite. Uh, we don't cold call. You say, oh, go to you know Hackensack, yep. New Jersey. Well, that's great. I would love to, but they need to invite me um, be because our volume is so big. Yep. Um, and it cuts a lot of the red tape. When I cold call somebody, they're like, well, what are you? What, do, what are you getting out of it? I'm like, nothing. I don't charge you for any of this stuff. Um, all I get out of it are the views that that will pay for my crew. Um, so we want to we want to get to all 300 places that we have on the list, but we also want to continue to move forward. And the only way for us to do that is to continue to, to get views and to get some kind of sponsorships to raise that finance. The one thing that I built into our mission statement when we created Heroes Next Door is I'm not going to charge a firehouse, EMS, or police station to go view their station. They're already struggling, especially those one-bay, two-bay places. They don't have the budget to spend. Pay, uh, film crew to come out. Yeah, they you know, can't, they can't. They can't spend that kind of money. They can't spend that kind of money on a social media platform, which may or may not go big or go viral. You know, I've seen a lot of people try to do their own stuff, but they get you know 200, 300 views. Using Heroes Next Door by inviting, I'm not going to charge you to do that. But the only way I can do that is if I can get some sponsorships from fire helmets, from air packs, from something like that. That's what I'm currently trying to build. Um, to help me get to those next stations. That's where that all comes down to. Now, will there ever be an expansion where it's it's you and a couple crews out there? Oh, I would love to. Because yeah. I mean, obviously, it would it would definitely make it a lot easier to hit all fifty states if you had if you had guys in different parts of the country yeah. hitting different departments. Yeah, I, I would love to kind of expand and and do that more too. I don't have to be the guy in front of the camera, hundred percent, but I want to get that information out there. So if you know, people are out there and they're listening and like, hey, I can film one and send it to Heroes Next Door. Great. Let's do that. I would most I would take that film from you. I would edit it down to, to what our platform is and throw it up and, and give you your 15 minutes of fame on a platform that's probably bigger than your station platform. Yeah, correct. I mean, yeah. So if, if people are listening or watching, yeah. make sure you, you know, you get your videos over to them and uh Maybe you'll you'll find you'll find a new videographer. Yeah, yeah. You never know. So uh, I got a real good crew. I got a young guy that usually travels with me. He's a, a wedding photographer. Uh, do more photography. Do more digital is his stuff. He does weddings during the summertime, so I kind of take a little break, and then we pick up you know the rest of the time. Uh, my wife, I've recruited to do some filming. <laughs> you know, I, I had a couple other people come and help me filming. So I'm always looking for more stuff to, to continue to expand. Um, but the ultimate goal is to continue to raise awareness uh, for fire, police, and EMS stations across the nation on what we are, uh, what we're doing, and how it all exists. That's great. I mean, it, it's 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 a necessary thing, and I think it's a it's a great you know platform you're working on and and trying to you know move the public safety image forward. 
Um, you know, it's it's been a, a rough go for the last, especially I, I think it's been post COVID. It's been we we've, we've seen the biggest like decline in in just volunteerism and membership. And I don't know if it's the economy, the post COVID. I don't know what kind of kicked it all off, but you know, I know around here, my local department, that's kind of when we we saw it drop off. I don't know if you know out where you are if it's the same or you know if it was before or after that, but. Uh, it was leading into that for sure, uh, but yeah, definitely post COVID when people are like, "Oh, this is too much of a risk. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to put my family at risk. I don't want to put me at risk." That's where it come down. For those that are concerned about that kind of stuff, we have mediations for those risks. We have ways to handle those risks. Uh, so I encourage you, if that was one of the things that were holding you back on not volunteering because you're afraid of that risk, the fire departments, EMS, and police departments have come up with programs to help mediate those kind of risks. That shouldn't hold you back any longer. When it first came out, 100%. No one knew what was going on. Government was back and forth. They didn't know what Things was going on. Things were shut down. Yeah, you know. was, they didn't know what was going on. I understood why people kind of took a step back and said, whoa, this is bigger than me. I don't know what's going on. Since then, we've, we've solved a lot of those issues. Uh, they're not as big as, the social, as regular media would tell you. Uh, we do have ways to, to mediate a lot of those issues and risks. Yeah, and it's funny because we never stopped responding. No. We changed the way we responded a little bit, especially in the fire service. I mean, right. But we never really stopped responding. We couldn't. We can't. You can't. Yeah. You got, you got to keep going, right? So, yeah. So, I mean, we changed down our, our you know, our, our SOGs. We had less guys on the app on each piece of apparatus. So if somebody did get sick, it wasn't going to infect everybody. You know, we wouldn't lose the whole department at once because, you know, back then it was, you know, 14 days of quarantine yeah. and, you know, you know, lock yourself away and – you lose people. Yeah. You're like, 14 days. I'm like, yeah. I was just exposed. I don't even have it. And you're yeah. going to put me in a room for 14 days. Yeah. So, yeah, during that time, 100% understand. Everybody was, you know, really confused on what it was, how serious it was going to be, that kind of stuff. And I'm not downplaying COVID in any no. way in the in the event. But now that we understand it, we know what's going on. We know how to decon stuff. We know how to, you know, washing our hands is a very important thing. Those kind of things we, we can take care of. Yeah, no, I agree. And and we did see a decline. Like, we saw a bunch of our older members who had some medical conditions. They kind of drifted away for a little bit. I'm like, hey, listen, I'm, which is understandable, yep. right? You're, yep. you're, you're older, you got a medical condition of some sort. You know, most of them have come back. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, it's been it's been an interesting couple of years. So so let me ask you, I don't know if you're, you're going to answer these questions or not, but favorite apparatus, what, what, what department was it? Uh, I think my favorite apparatus – of the ones I've reviewed or the yeah, ones I've worked on? <laughs> Whichever. Okay. Whichever. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, that's a tough one because there's so many that are out there, and they love showing the heavy rescues. You know, that's one of their, their pride and joy of lots of different things. Princeton Heavy Rescue, Jeremy from National Fire Radio just dropped a video on it. I did a station it, – it's a great rescue. The fact that it's EMS-related and not in a fire department, it's a little unusual. Yep. Um. I went out to East Grand Rapids and uh, did a, a complete station cribs and station rigs. I think it's just a station cribs on that one. They're a combination fire department and police department. They're both, you know, and it was interesting to see how that worked. That was pretty cool. There's one of those in Florida that I know of. Yeah. That, and it's, it's, it's all three. Yeah. They do fire, EMS, and police work. And it's, East, East Grand Rapids did the same thing. It's, pretty, it's a pretty cool concept. I mean, it's, I guess if you're not that busy – you yeah. don't have a lot of fire calls. You don't have a lot of police calls. You're okay. Right. What happens when the storm rips through? It, well, you got everybody there. It, it's covered both ways. Yeah, that's true, too. Yeah. <laughs> you got a full crew all the time because you got it both paid. So that was kind of interesting. But as far as apparatus, I think I definitely like the rescues uh, that are out there. There was a very unique truck up in um, Leland Township, Michigan. It was a hydrant truck. Basically, it was a pump on the back of a pickup truck because they have a lot of waterways. Michigan's all water. You can't travel a mile in a straight line without hitting water. So they draft a lot. It's a okay. drafting truck. Um, but, you know, they didn't have to put an engine out of service to draft. You know, they're like, oh, my engine. You're right. Your engine does that. I, I'm not saying it doesn't. But why take that apparatus that has all the other tools and put it at a water source and now it's, it's stuck there, right? And it could be it could be pretty far away too. Correct, right? correct. So they designed this F550 or 350 or whatever it was and basically put the, the pump 
that's normally in the engine on the back of this pickup truck, and they draft all the time. You know, yes, it, they don't need a tank or anything. They don't need they a tank just... or nothing. Yeah, and they hook it up. So that was pretty cool. That you know, just seeing the different neat, designs. Different neat stuff out there, right? Right, right. And then South Metro, they had a brand new uh, airport truck. Oh, that's uh, pretty cool. Those, those are those awesome. things are those things are just yeah, they look cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, the way the cab is designed, the nozzles they have on them. You know how they approach the fire. That you know, those are all kind of cool stuff. Did you get to drive one of those? I did not. I, I rode in it, but I haven't driven. I would one. love to drive one. They're just massive. They're massive, and they're center, center drives. Yeah, center drives. So it, you know, I was talking to him during the interview process, and he goes, "It take it takes a little bit because we naturally want to go against that yellow line or that you know double yellow line because that's where we line up." Well, if you do that there, you're hanging off on the other side. And he's like, "We really got to pay attention that we're in the center of the truck." And how to drive those kind of trucks. That's pretty, I would have never even thought about that. But, yeah, because you see it. I've seen them where, where all of a sudden two guys hop out and the guy's still sitting in the middle. And I'm like, oh, it's a center drive. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, but, so I've, I've seen a lot across the nation. I love all of them. You know, I'm, I'm always a little kid. Yeah. I'm like, this is pretty cool. And you, always, you, you always find something neat, right? Something you didn't think of at a, at a different state. Oh, I didn't know they did that. Or Correct. You know, correct. Yeah, I always have. You know I, know, I know you know Jeremy. I know Jeremy, too. And, you know, he's always got, like – He'll he'll find at a firehouse like a something that they do that's odd that yeah. nobody ever thought of right that makes complete sense and you're like why didn't we think of that yeah like you know putting a little step in this location you're like why did we jump on the board all the time like that would have been perfect you know yeah. those those different kind of things so I'm always learning every time I go out I learn something new uh, and and seeing how each mission profile for every department is also a little bit different oh yeah you know I, the one that I talked about Ada Ohio. You know, every truck has 2,500 gallons of water on it. And they don't call them tankers. They call them engines because that's what they wanted to do. That's they, they, so. Are it, they tankers or are they tenders? It, it, well, <laughs> that's another thing. I, I heard, I heard yeah. that conversation you had. And we, we had that conversation. We have, a, we have a tank. Well, technically it's a tender, but we have a tanker at our firehouse. So, right. So, you know, when we were. I grew up at the, in the firehouse, it was called a tanker. And people are like, oh, it's supposed to be a tender. Right. The tankers fly in the air. And I'm like. We've been a tanker for ever since I've known it. Right. I didn't realize that until I hit the Midwest. You know, I grew up in Michigan, but I wasn't involved back then. But as soon as you hit the Midwest, terminology changes. Yep. So, you know, whether it's a tanker, brush truck, you know. Quick attack. Quick attack. Mini pumper. Yeah. Yeah. It just <laughs> depends on where you are in the they're country, They're all the same right? thing. It's just, yep. it's just a, a different word for the same equipment. And, um, you know, it's. It's unique, and I, I enjoy talking to the guys and spending time and learning what their terminology. Is it a cylinder or a bottle? You know, many times they're like, oh, it's an air bottle. No, it's an air cylinder. Bottles are for water, you know, yeah. and they're very strong opinion. Is it, a la- is it a ladder or is it a tower? Is it a truck? You know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Is it, a, is, it a, is it a quint or is it a truck? Right. Or is it, yeah. And you, you get those truck guys, they'll, you know, they get very defensive about what it is sometimes. So. Right, right. Yeah, I think we call them air. Aerials. No, but we call air bo- we call air packs, air bottles. We don't call them cylinders here. Yeah, cylinder, right? Yeah, we call them pa- you know bottles. Change air my, bottles. Change yep. my bottle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you go out Midwest, they're like, "That's for water." Right? What do you mean? You know, it's an air cylinder. <laughs> See, again, it's, it's always you know different stuff, but it's it's it must be interesting to travel around and get to do that. And so you're not cold calling anymore, but do you ever just are you ever driving past a firehouse and like see somebody and you're like. Man, it looks like a cool place. I'm just going to stop in and say hi. I have. So I say I don't cold call, but occasionally if I'm driving past, I'll I'll pull over and I'll leave my card. You know, if so if you guys are any of the firehouses that are out there that all of a sudden had this, you know, Heroes Next Door card in your door, that's me. You know, I'm just saying, hey, I saw your cool firehouse. I stop by. I, I stop by, I put it in the door, and uh, hopefully, you know, you'll call me and, and we can set something up. But, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. I have a question for you, though. You know, we're going to kind of flip the script here a little bit. Okay, go Tell ahead. Tell me a little bit about 1075. 1075. Oh, it was, uh, we started off as a very small company uh, back in 2000, 2003. Um, I was working so I, I was working in law enforcement at the same time. So um, 1075 was kind of – I worked for somebody doing some sales of, of emergency vehicles. Okay. Uh, command vehicles, chief's cars. Uh, paramedic units, and they were out of based out of Virginia, and I was trying to sell vehicles up here, and I, I was selling but not really selling because it, what they were doing down there, wasn't what people up here wanted, so I said, hey, listen, this is the package that I want to put together and sell in New Jersey. Okay, 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 and you know, 
brush you off, brush you off, brush you off. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to just, you know, get brushed off by these guys and lose, you know, I'm putting my time and effort in sure. and I'm not getting sales because what's good for Virginia is not good up here. Yeah. And so I, I finally said, you know what? Let me start something. So I had a business partner. We started two of us out of a trailer and basically we started, you know, just running around, you know, doing, it was small installs. We started small. Okay. And then it just grew from there. We find, we got a shop. We had a little 1,500 square foot shop. And we were able to do like three vehicles at a time. You know, we went from doing one to three. We had an indoor. We weren't working under tents. We weren't working in parking lots. So we, we, we hit the big time. Yeah. And then um, I had a change in partnership. Ryan, who's my partner now, came on board. And we were growing. And it, the growth was slow, but it was – we were happy with it. You know, we were doing some command vehicles. And then Ryan started promoting on social media. And the company saw a pretty big growth right then and there because the younger people that were involved in the fire service were starting to, you know, Ryan's probably 15 years younger than me. So he was more into that social media. I was, you know, I'm a Gen X guy. You know, I grew <laughs> yeah. up outside, so it was a little different. Right. Um, so... We hit that kind of market, and then he was. We were making these command boxes, building them, cutting them in my basement on a on a table saw. Okay, putting them together, and they they were like, you know, we were sitting there having to sand them. They things weren't weren't, weren't coming together right, and so finally Ryan's like, hey, listen, let's buy a small CNC machine, we'll make our own command boxes. Okay, we buy that, and we start making our own command boxes, and then he's like, we're not using it all the time. So let's start selling them to other upfitters around the country that do what we do. Okay. Well, that's where we exploded because people were looking for a quality product that they could offer, and we were doing custom. So, in, as you know, in the fire service and EMS, we all don't carry the same equipment. We right. all don't have the same exact missions, even though we do. Yeah. You know, you may carry two AEDs. We carry one AED in a, in a med bag, but we also might carry water rescue gear. And so everybody's got a little bit different layout of how they want things in their command vehicles. Sure. So we started doing the custom. And it, it took off. We went from having one CNC machine running about two hours a day to we have two CNC machines running full time now. Nice. So it's really it's really grown. Um, we've done some some interesting builds. We've done a, um, a portable classroom, a mobile classroom. It's a, basically a mobile STEM lab. Okay. Um, that's, that has the ability... It's a 28-foot or 30-foot box truck. Has the ability to work as a, as a, a whole outdoor classroom and can run eight hours with either AC or heat with, without running a generator or the engine. Wow. So, we, you know, we had to meet all these requirements, you know, so we had to use batteries and, and figure all this, this out to make sure that we were going to, you know, be able to, to operate w if it was unplugged just sitting in a parking lot on its own. So we've done some really big bills. We did the... Um, we did a mobile, we turned an old school bus into basically a portable hospital. Had 11, I think it was 11 stretchers that we had in okay. it. So it's a nice mass casualty unit. Mass casualty unit. Yep. Yeah, yep. It had, you know, it had uh, oxygen ports, uh, you know, oxygen ports in all the locations, you know, electric, you know, Wi-Fi. Got to have Wi-Fi so everybody, you know, and they, you know, they use it as a rehab bus when, it, when they go to fire. So okay. in the cold, they can use it for rehab. And that was for the local county over here. So we, we've grown over the years and it's just been... Post COVID, it's been a whirlwind. It really has been. Okay. Um, it's been crazy growth, and then you know, we we went from Ryan doing all the social media to adding a marketing department, and that just kind of, you know, Good. we watched the growth really happen because he was trying to do you know wear all the hats, and once we brought in, you know, and understood and had people that understood, you know, right, you know, you know all the all the the nuances behind the marketing and and all the you know the searching and all that stuff. Once we got that, that's where, you know, because a lot of your chiefs now are that generation where they're, they, they kind of grew up at the tail end of the phones. So they, they have the Facebook, they have the Instagram, they watch the reels. Yeah. Um, you know, and now the younger guys are, you know, all over the TikTok and they're like, oh, I saw your, and I'm like, you know, so. Perfect. Yeah, I'm, it's great. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. 
but that's how we grew. Um, so it just kind of it kind of grew out of that. It was a it was a real you know. It, so are you more? Do you make the boxes, or are there two separate two sides? two separate sides? Okay, so we so have the, have... we have the ten seventy five side of it. And we have the, the first in manufacturing side. So okay. the 1075 is the vehicle conversion side. Okay. So we do that. And then we have the first in command boxes, which is pretty much we do a lot of paramedic trucks, uh, a lot of pullouts for, for pickup trucks, bigger right. stuff. Okay. Um, so that's the first in side. So we do both. Um, so, like, if there's a an install, like an installer somewhere that says, hey, I like your, your product, well, you can buy it on our, on our wholesale side and you can sell it to your customers. Okay. Now, are you nationwide uh, as far as the, the we're, boxes? Yeah, or? we're pretty much nationwide. If we're not nationwide, if we don't have a dealer near them, we will drop ship to a firehouse, okay. uh, you know, EMS building or, or wherever they're getting it upfitted. If they're not a, a dealer of ours, we'll still deliver it there and they can install it okay. for them. And it's then your outfit is more local? More local stuff. I mean, we do get some, we got some people traveling seven, eight hours to drop off a vehicle because they want, they want to use, because, you know. We, right. saw, we saw you on, on social media and right, they right. follow us. So, right. um, it's I mean, we great. pick up fire trucks all the time from Wisconsin and, you know, Indiana. So, you know, why not? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I don't, I don't know if too many people want to come up here to New Jersey to pick up cars, <laughs> especially this time of year. It's right. starting to get, we're starting to get a little cool. But, um, you know, and then this this kind of grew out of out of all that was, hey, listen, you know, let's let's take it to an, another level and, and add a podcast to it. And, you know, we had to. A little bit of space that freed up, so that we were like, "Yeah, we could do this here." Yeah. So, um, Got a and nice it's been setup. good. Yeah, thank you. And you know, we enjoy doing it, and we enjoy having people like you, so that you know, it's kind of a cross exposure thing, right? We, you get exposure to, to our, you know, our our customer base, and we get to see, you know, your followers as well. So sure. Um, sure. You know, but uh, so hopefully in a future episode, I'd like to come back because you're only two and a half hours away. And I'll do a station cribs with you and show me how your shop works. And absolutely, and we'd like love that. we'd love to have you. We'd yeah, love to have you yeah. come up. So if you're out there listening or watching right now, definitely pay attention. I'm going to come back for sure and do a whole station station cribs with 1075. So. We used to have a really cool uh, building up in Buffalo. It was uh, we were doing conversions out of a an old uh, firehouse. Okay. So it was pretty cool. It was yeah. like it had because it had a little bit of history to it. Right. Right. Um, but we outgrew it. Okay. So, unfortunately, you know, we had to go to a bigger facility up there. So, so from the police side, the 10 numbers, 1075. Fire. Bad, fire? 1075, uh, City of New York, work on fire. Okay. Because so. I thought it was bad weather, the old 10 codes. Well, yeah, it depends. <laughs> yeah. It depends, you know. So Work on fire. I like it. I like so, it. So, and then, and then we found out, we completely stumbled into it, that, you know, we go to trade shows. The numbers are before the before the alphabet. So on the trade show list, you're usually near the top. Yeah. So that's why when we we did the second company, we stayed with the number first in. Right. So that we're, right. It's like so. the old phone books. People may not know that because we're now on social media. The phone phone books used to be triple A plumbing, you know, because they wanted to be the first yep. in the phone book. Yep. <laughs> so, exactly. Exactly. White pages and yellow pages. Ex- I remember those exactly. Days. Yeah. So you used to have to look stuff up. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you, you know, taking me out here and, you know, having the time to, to sit down and talk with me. I know you're a busy dude, uh, you know, taking care of business and everything like that. So, you know, I, I appreciate you as a volunteer. I appreciate you as a business owner doing it all. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can continue to, to move absolutely, forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you for making the drive out here. It was great to, you know, to actually get down and get to sit down and, and you know, BS for a little bit and, and talk about uh, life and and. How it is, you know, I know we're only two and a half hours apart, but it's probably world's different. Uh, it is. The way people operate, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so. I can get into Jersey, but I got to pay to get out. So that's always an issue. I can show you there's a free bridge you can go across, <laughs> but you got to kind of take it. They'll take you out of the way a little bit. Right. But, uh, uh, no, I absolutely love it. You know, Jersey here, Delaware, everything, you know, in this kind of eastern corner. Uh, it makes it easy to, to, to come out and visit you guys and, and see what's going on. And just learning from, you know, town to town. Everybody does it just a little bit different. Everybody has a little bit um, twist on it. But if we continue to open our ears, open our eyes, and see what's going on around us, we don't get stuck in our sandbox, I truly believe that we're going to continue to advance. We're going to make the service better. We're going to bring in those next generations that understand what's going on because we've taken the time as leadership to reach out to them. You know, we you know we can't expect them to reach to us all the time. We need to also extend that hand and say, hey, brother, sister, I'm here for you. Come out and help us. Yeah, I mean, the outreach is great. We need to have the outreach because 
they're not banging. I mean, I remember when I first joined, people were beating the door down to get to join. Now it's we gotta we gotta reach out to them. Yep. So. Yep. And if you're out there and you're you got a firehouse that you want to do a uh, station crib on, reach out to Heroes Next Door. Mike, appreciate your time today, and uh, look forward to meeting up with you again. And uh, and we'll do a little tour of this, the shop next time. Yeah, sounds awesome. I so, appreciate you. Thank you.